Hello, I'm Nikki, and today I'm the traumatized and the abandoned, and welcome to our podcast, where we talk about true crime, spooky things, and everything in between, and today I'm going to be talking about the unsolved mystery of the disappearance of Amelia Earhart. So here we are. It's just me today. Uh, like we said in previous episodes, or if you're new here, my partner in crime, Jess, is in the middle of moving. So while she gets settled in and set up, it'll just be me. We are both hoping it won't be too many episodes. We're actually hoping that it's just this episode that with her missing. But until then, I guess I'll just get right into it. Also, disclaimer, it is just me. This is like my first time recording solo. It's weird for you. It's weird for me. But here we go. Uh, I guess I'll just get right to it. Fun fact of the day. Did you know it took the creator of the Rubik's Cube one month to solve the cube after he created it? Insane. I still haven't figured that thing out. So, uh, Amelia Earhart was an American aviation pioneer and best-selling author. Earhart was the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean, and she set many other flying records as well, which we'll get to later. But first, we're going to talk about her early life. Amelia was born on July 24, 1897 in Atchison, Kansas. Her father, Samuel Edwin Stanton Earhart, was a railroad lawyer, and her mother, Amelia Amy, Nee Otis, was from an affluent family. Growing up, Amelia displayed an adventurous and independent nature, for which she would later become known for. After the death of her grandparents, the family struggled financially amid her father's alcoholism. The family would end up moving often, but Amelia graduated from Chicago's Hyde Park High School in 1916. After her mother received her inheritance, Amelia began junior college in Rydell, Pennsylvania. Though she did not complete her program because during a visit to her sister in Toronto, Canada, Amelia developed an interest in caring for the soldiers wounded in World War I. After receiving training as a nurse's aide from the Red Cross, she began to work with the Voluntary Aid Detachment at Spadina Military Hospital. Her duties included preparing food in the kitchen for patients with special diets and handing out prescribed medication in the hospital's dispensary. It was said that while caring for the men, Amelia heard stories from military pilots that piqued her interest in flying. It is also said that during this time, she began to spend time watching pilots in the Royal Flying Corps train at a local airfield. When the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic reached Toronto, Earhart was engaged in arduous nursing duties that included night shifts at at the Spadina Military Hospital. And she became a patient herself, experiencing pneumonia and maxillary sinusitis. Because of this, Amelia would suffer from chronic sinusitis that significantly affected her flying and activities later in life. It would also lead to multiple surgeries. In 1919, Amelia enrolled in a course in medical studies and other programs at Columbia University. But just a year later, she quit to be with her parents who had reunited in California. In December 1920, Amelia and her father attended an aerial meet at Dottery Field in Long Beach, California. The next day, she was booked for a passenger flight at Emory Rogers Field. It cost $10 for a 10-minute flight with Frank Cox, and this flight would forever change her life. Amelia said about the flight, By the time I had gotten two or 300 feet off the ground, I knew I had to fly. The next month, Earhart recruited Netta Snook to be her flying instructor. Netta Snook was a pioneer aviator herself who achieved a long list of firsts as well for female aviators. The initial contract was for 12 hours of instruction for $500, working a variety of jobs including photography, truck driver, stenographer at a local telephone company. She managed to save $1,000 for flying lessons. Earhart had her first lesson on January 3rd, 1921 at Kenner Field on the west side of Long Beach Boulevard and Tweedy Road, now in the city of Southgate. Snook used a crash salvage Curtis 
JN4 Canuck that Snook had restored for training. Six months later, in the summer of 1921, Earhart purchased a secondhand bright chromium yellow Kenner Airster biplane against Snook's advice, which she nicknamed the Canary. Earhart passed her flight test in December 1921 earning a National Aeronautics Association license. Two days later, she participated in her first flight exhibition at the Sierra Airdrome in Pasadena, California. On October 22nd, in 1922, Earhart flew the Airster to an altitude of 14,000 feet, setting a world record for female pilots. On May 16th, 1923, Earhart became the 16th woman in the United States to be issued a pilot's license by the Federation Aeronautique International. And I'm so sorry if I butchered the pronunciation. I'm not good with French. But it was also known as the FAI. Throughout the early 1920s, following a disastrous investment in a failed uh, gypsum mine, Earhart's inheritance from her grandmother, which was now administered by her mother, steadily diminished until it was exhausted. Consequently, with no immediate prospects for recouping her investment in flying, Earhart sold the canary as well as a second kinner and bought a yellow Kissel Gold Bug Speedster two-seat automobile, which she named the Yellow Pearl. I kind of have a hinkling that yellow was her favorite color. Just a, just a little. In 1924, Amelia's parents divorced, but she and her mother hopped into Yellow Pearl and they went on a transcontinental trip, ending up in Boston, Massachusetts. Amelia returned to Columbia University for several months, but was forced to abandon her studies and any further plans for enrolling at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology because her mother could no longer afford the tuition fees and associated costs. Soon after, though, she found employment first as a teacher, then as a social worker in 1925 at Denison House, a Boston settlement house. And I kind of looked into what a settlement house was. So the settlement movement was a reformist social movement that began in the 1880s, and peaked around the 1920s in the United Kingdom and the United States. Its goal was to bring the rich and the poor of society together in both physical proximity and social interconnectedness. So I guess a settlement house is where they would have these events. When Earhart lived in Medford, Massachusetts, she maintained her interest in aviation, becoming a member of the American Aeronautical Society's Boston chapter and was eventually elected its vice president. Also while in Massachusetts, Amelia helped finance Denison Airport, later called the Naval Air Station Squatum, by investing a small sum of money. Earhart also flew the first official flight out of, along with acting as a sales representative for Kinner Aircraft in the Boston area, Earhart wrote local newspaper columns promoting flying, And as her local celebrity grew, she laid out the plans for an organization devoted to female flyers. So now I'm going to start talking about more of Amelia's flying career. And it all started with a transatlantic flight in 1928. So in 1927, Charles Lindbergh made a solo flight across the Atlantic Ocean successfully and became the first person to do so. During this time, promoters sought to have a woman fly across the Atlantic Ocean. While at work one afternoon in April 1928, Earhart got a phone call from Captain Hilton H. Rayleigh, who asked her, would you like to fly the Atlantic? To which Earhart promptly replied, yes. The project coordinators interviewed Earhart and asked her to accompany pilot Wilmer Stoltz, co-pilot slash mechanic Louis or Lewis Gordon on the flight, nominally as a passenger, but with the added duty of keeping the flight log. The team departed from Trapassi Harbor, Newfoundland, in a Fokker F-7B named Friendship on June 17, 1928, landing near Burryport, 
South Wales, exactly 20 hours and 40 minutes later. Their landmark flight made headlines worldwide because three pilots had died within the year trying to be the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. Since most of the flight was on instruments and Earhart had no training for this type of flying, she did not pilot the aircraft. When interviewed after landing, she said, Stoltz did all the flying. Had to. I was just baggage. Like a sack of potatoes. She added, maybe someday I'll try it alone. When the crew returned to the United States, they were greeted with a ticker tape parade in New York and a reception held by President Calvin Coolidge at the White House. Shortly after her return, Amelia, piloting an Avian 7083, set off on her first long solo flight. By making this trip in August 1928, Amelia became the first woman to fly solo across the North American continent and back. Amelia subsequently made her first attempt at competitive air racing in 1929. During the first Santa Monica to Cleveland Women's Air Derby, nicknamed the Powder Puff Derby, which left Santa Monica, California on August 18th and arrived at Cleveland, Ohio on August 26th. At Cleveland, Amelia was placed third in the heavy division. So she got third place. Not bad. During this, George Putnam, a publisher, uh, entered Amelia's life. The two spent a great deal of time together and developed a strong friendship. Then they married on February 7th, 1931, in Putnam's mother's house in Connecticut. Intent on retaining her independence, she referred to the marriage as a partnership with dual control which was very liberal and I think a very ahead of her time. On April 8th, 1931, she set a world altitude record of 18,415 feet, flying a Pitcairn PCA-2 autogyro, which is a type of rotorcraft that uses an unpowered rotor in free auto rotation to develop lift. So. While similar to a helicopter rotor in appearance, the autogyro's unpowered rotor disc must have air flowing upward across it to make it rotate. So basically, it just needs like an influx of air pushing on the rotors for it to run. Also around this time, Amelia and her husband worked on secret plans for her to become the first woman and the second person to fly solo across the Atlantic. On May 20th, 1932, five years to the day after Lindbergh, she took off from Harbor Grace, Newfoundland, with her destination being Paris. Unfortunately, strong north winds, icy conditions, and mechanical problems plagued the flight and forced her to land in a pasture near Londonderry, Ireland. The flight was completed in a record time of 14 hours and 56 minutes. As the first woman to fly solo nonstop across the Atlantic, Earhart received the Distinguished Flying Cross from Congress, the Cross of Knight of the Legion of Honor from the French government, and the Gold Medal of the National Geographic Society from President Herbert Hoover. On January 11, 1935, Earhart became the first aviator to fly solo from Honolulu, Hawaii to Oakland, California, using a Lockheed 5C Vega. That same year, she flew solo from Los Angeles to Mexico City. Then her next record attempt was a solo nonstop flight from Mexico City to New York. The flight was successful and pretty much uneventful. Earhart again participated in long distance air racing, placing fifth in the 1935 Bendix Trophy race. The best result she could manage because her stock Lockheed Vega, which topped out at 195 miles per hour, was way outclassed by purpose-built air racers that reached more than 300 miles per hour. Between 1930 and 1935, Earhart had set seven women's speed and distance aviation records in a variety of aircraft, including the Kinner Airster, the Lockheed Vega, and the Pitcairn Autogyro. 
Now to the part we've all been waiting for. Flying around the world. As Amelia neared her 40th birthday, she was ready for a monumental and final challenge. She wanted to be the first woman to fly around the world. Early in 1936, Amelia started planning a round-the-world flight. Although others had flown around the world, mostly in like the North Arctic areas, uh, her flight would be the longest at 29,000 miles because it followed a roughly equatorial route. In July 1936, a Lockheed Electra 10E was built at Lockheed Aircraft Company to her specifications, which included extensive modifications to the fuse lodge to incorporate many additional fuel tanks. Earhart chose Captain Harry Manning as her navigator. He had been the captain of the SS President Roosevelt, the ship that had brought Amelia back from Europe in 1928. Manning was not only a navigator, but he was also a pilot and a skilled radio operator who knew Morse code. After a few test flights, Manning's navigating wasn't completely up to par, so a second navigator was selected, who was Fred Noonan. Noonan was experienced in both marine, uh, as he was a licensed ship captain, and flight navigation. The original plans were for Noonan to navigate from Hawaii to Howland Island, and particularly difficult portion of the flight. Then Manning would continue with Earhart to Australia, and she would proceed on her own for the remainder of the project. So, on March 17th, 1937, Amelia and her crew flew the first leg from Oakland, California to Honolulu, Hawaii. In addition to Amelia and Noonan, Harry Manning and Paul Mance, who was a friend and business partner who was acting as Amelia's technical advisor, were on board. Due to lubrication and galling problems with the propeller hubs, variable pitch mechanisms, the aircraft needed servicing in Hawaii. Ultimately, the Electra ended up at the United States Navy's Luke Field on Fort Island in Pearl Harbor. Three days later, the flight was to continue with the next destination being Howland Island, a small island in the Pacific. During the takeoff run, though, there was an uncontrollable ground loop. The forward landing gear collapsed, both propellers hit the ground, and the plane skidded on its belly. A portion of the runway was also damaged because of this. And in aviation, a ground loop is like a rapid rotation of a fixed-winged aircraft in the horizontal plane while on the ground. So basically there was just an uncontrollable rotation. Usually it causes the airplane to like have one wing lift up while the other one like is down and it obviously severely damaged this aircraft. So with the aircraft severely damaged, the flight was called off and the aircraft was shipped by sea back to the Lockheed Burbank facility for repairs. Manning, having taken a leave of absence to do this flight, felt that there had been too many problems and delays and he ended his association with the trip, leaving only Amelia and Noonan, neither of whom were skilled in radio operations. And this brings us to their second attempt. This time, instead of flying east to west, they, were, they decided to fly west to east. The second attempt began with an unpublicized flight from Oakland to Miami, Florida. And after arriving there, Amelia publicly announced her plans to circumnavigate the globe. The pair departed Miami on June 1st, and after numerous stops in South America, Africa, the Indian subcontinent, and Southeast Asia, they arrived at Leh, New Guinea on June 29th, 1937. At this stage, about 22,000 miles of the journey had been completed. The remaining 7,000 miles would be over the Pacific Ocean. Frequently inaccurate maps had made navigation difficult for Noonan, and their next hop to Howland Island was by far the most challenging. Located 2,556 miles from Ley in the mid-Pacific, Howland Island is a mile and a half long and half a mile wide, so a very tiny island in a massive ocean. Every unessential item was removed from the plane to make room for additional fuel, which gave Amelia approximately 274 extra miles. The U.S. Coast Guard cutter Itasca 
their radio contact was stationed just offshore of Howland Island. Two other U.S. ships ordered to burn every light on board were positioned along the flight route as markers. And on July 2nd, the pair took off. Despite ideal weather reports, they flew into overcast skies and intermittent rain showers. This made Noonan's favored method of tracking celestial navigation difficult. As dawn neared, Amelia called the Itisca, reporting cloudy weather, cloudy. In later transmissions, Amelia asked the Itisca to take bearings on her. The Tisca sent her a steady stream of transmissions, but it seemed that she could not hear them. At 7.42 a.m., the Tisca picked up a message. We must be on you, but we cannot see you. Fuel is running low, but unable to reach you by radio. We are flying at a thousand feet. The ship tried to reply, but again, the plane seemed not to be able to hear. At 8.45, Amelia reported, we are running north and south on a specific line. Nothing further was heard from her. So based on her last two radio transmissions, it sounded like she was on a single longitude line going north and south trying to find the tiny island. And like I said, nothing further was heard from her. A rescue attempt immediately commenced and became the most expensive air and sea search in naval history. On July 19th, after spending $4 million and scouring over 250,000 square miles of ocean, the United States government reluctantly called off the operation. Immediately after the end of the official search, Putnam, Amelia's husband, financed a private search by local authorities of nearby Pacific Islands and waters, concentrating on the Gilberts Islands. In late July 1937, Putnam chartered two small boats and while he remained in the United States, directed a search of the Phoenix Islands, Christmas, or sorry if I mispronounce any of these words, Kiritimati Island, Banning or Ta- Taburan Island, the Gilbert Islands, and the Marshall Islands, but no trace of the Electra or its occupants was found. Back in the United States, Putnam acted to become the trustee of Amelia's estate so that he could pay for the searches and related bills. In probate court in Los Angeles, he also requested to have the declared dead in absentia seven-year waiting period waived so that he could manage her finances. As a result, Amelia Earhart was declared legally dead on January 5th, 1939. So, the theories... (laughs) There has been considerable speculation on what happened to Amelia and Newton. Most historians hold the simple crash and sink theory, but a number of other possibilities have been proposed, including several conspiracy theories, which we'll go into a few of them. So the first theory, crash and sink, I think is the most popular theory. I think it's what most people think happened. It's very plausible that this happened. Like I said, this is one of the most generally accepted versions of the famous aviator's disappearance. Many experts believe Amelia and Noonan got slightly off course en route to their refueling stop at Howland Island. According to the so-called crash and sink theory, the plane eventually ran out of gas and plunged into the ocean, killing both Earhart and Noonan. Then it sank, leaving no sign of their whereabouts. Another scenario is Gardner Island. And in this scenario, Amelia missed her intended refueling site, Howland Island, but spotted Gardner Island, noun as Nukumaroro, sorry if I say that wrong, which is an uninhabited coral atoll nearby. Even though the island was searched by Navy planes a week after Amelia went missing and they found no evidence of an airplane or even life. The theory says that she landed safely, but died before she could be rescued. And this theory has gained ground in recent years due to the discovery of some artifacts on the island that could be related to Amelia. Items including an empty jar of the freckle cream she preferred 
and a piece of plexiglass similar to that which would have been used in the Lockheed Electra planes she flew. Also, side note, had no idea buckle cream was a thing. I don't know if you guys know, but I have a shit ton of freckles. But apparently, back then, it was like this type of cream that you could put on to like diminish your freckles. But apparently, it was like super toxic, like most cosmetics were back then. Uh, so no, thank you. I'll I'll stick to my freckles. Thank you. Another reason why this theory was so boasted is a set of bones were actually found on this island, but they were tested and found not to be Amelia's. Also, in August 2019, Robert Ballard, the ocean explorer known for locating the wreck of the Titanic, led a team to search for Amelia's plane in the waters around the island. Again, they found no signs of the Electra. So, I don't know about that theory. Another theory, this is a super interesting theory. I don't think it holds any weight, but it is interesting. So this theory is the theory that Amelia and Noonan were captured by Japanese forces, perhaps after somehow navigating to somewhere within the Japanese South Seas mandate. In 1966, CBS correspondent Fred Gorner published a book claiming that Earhart and Noonan were captured and executed when their aircraft crashed on the island of Saipan, part of the Northern Mariana Islands archipelago. Saipan is more than 2,700 miles away from Howland Island. However, later proponents of the Japanese capture hypothesis have generally suggested the Marshall Islands instead, which, while still a good distance from the intended location, is slightly more possible. In 1990, the NBC series Unsolved Mysteries broadcast an interview with a Saipanese woman who claimed to have witnessed Amelia and Noonan's execution by Japanese soldiers, but no independent confirmation has ever emerged for any of these claims. In the 2017 documentary Amelia Earhart, The Lost Evidence, uh, this documentary proposed to have new evidence supporting the capture theory. The Evidence in question was a photograph found in the National Archives at College Park of Jaluit Atoll in the South Seas Mandate, the Japanese mandate for the Marshall Islands. The photograph includes two European-looking people amongst a few natives. The documentary through a forensic analyst who specialized in facial recognition posited that it was very likely to be a picture of a captured Amelia and Noonan, which actually I'm going to describe for you real quick. So in this picture, it's like a a normal picture of like a dock. You see a bunch of fishing boats in the water. And in the background, you see um, what looks like to be a military ship. And it was confirmed that it is a military ship. But if you look closer, so if you zoom in to like the people, there's about, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people on the stock. And the person all the way to the left is what they think is who they think is uh, Frank Noonan. He's like holding on to a pole or like leaning on a pole uh, because it's speculated that he like had a knee injury or something from the supposed crash. So he's kind of leaning on the pole and then there's what looks to be like some natives and then kind of like in the background of them all standing together is what's speculated to be a female sitting or what I kind of describe as I kind of described as kneeling or like, you know, how you're not necessarily kneeling, but squatting. So to me, it looks like a woman squatting down at the end of the dock and is speculating that she's this female who's squatting down is looking um at the warship or the military ship or like what the military ship is kind of dragging behind it um because in the picture they speculate that there's a lot of speculation in this (laughs) Uh, but in the picture, they speculate that the military ship is dragging a barge, and on that barge is the supposed Electra, the crashed plane. 
So they say that the man all the way to the left is Frank Noonan and the woman crouching is Amelia looking at her damaged plane being hauled by this military ship. So that's the evidence that they provided in this documentary. It suggests that perhaps the Koshu Maru, which is the military ship in the picture that has been confirmed, uh, transported them to Saipan where they died in custody. The documentary also cited existing evidence for the Japanese capture hypothesis, such as locals who claim to have, to have witnessed a plane crash at Millie Atoll. It also suggests that the U.S. government might have known about the capture and covered this knowledge up. So kind of like from my understanding from watching the documentary, uh, they found this picture amongst a bunch of other pictures that were basically surveillance on the Japanese for World War II. And so the documentary speculates that because uh, the U.S. was spying on Japan, they didn't want Japan to know that they were spying on them by, by being like, hey, we know you have Amelia. They didn't want Japan knowing that they were doing surveillance. So that's why they're saying it's like a cover up. That's why they didn't go and save Amelia from the Japanese if she was captured. Though all of this brand new information, the documentary was highly criticized and the History Channel actually ended up pulling it off the air because it was like a cable documentary. They ended up pulling it off the air and announced that it would not be available on any streaming platforms. I was able to find it, though, and watch it. A slightly different version of the Japanese capture hypothesis is not that the Japanese captured Amelia, but rather that they shot her plane down. Basically, there's a bunch of mini theories within the Japanese capture theory, and these I just kind of covered like the big ones. But a common criticism of all the versions of the Japanese capture theory is that the Japanese-controlled Marshall Islands were a considerable distance away from Howland Island, which is where they were headed. And from her radio transmission, she basically said, like, we're on top of you, I just can't see you, that they were low on fuel. So how would they, if they were saying, we're right on top of you, how would they be like 2,000 miles away? Uh, To me, it doesn't make sense. So to reach and land there would have required Amelia Noonan, though low on fuel, to change her northeast course as she neared Howland Island and fly hundreds of miles northwest. It, like I said, it just doesn't make sense. Another theory is that Amelia may have turned back mid-flight, which, again, I don't know about this one. But she would then have tried to reach the airfield at Rapal, New Britain, which is northeast of mainland Papua New Guinea, approximately 2,200 miles from Howland. In 1990, Donald Angwin, a veteran of the Australian Army's World War II campaign in New Britain, contacted researchers to suggest that a wrecked aircraft he had witnessed in the jungle about 40 miles southwest of Rapal on April 17, 1945, and he thinks it may have been Earhart's Electra. In the first episode of Expedition Unknown, kind of one of my guilty pleasures, Josh Gates and his team get permission from the local tribe of the area of this crash site to go and look at it. The locals then led him through the jungle where they located the crash site, but they were only able to locate one engine and a piece of undercarriage. And Josh and the expert that he was with kind of verified that uh, this was an Amelia's plane. For one, there should have been two engines for the type of plane she was flying, and the undercarriage was like double walled where Amelia's wasn't. I'm if I'm remembering correctly. So they kind of confirmed that it wasn't Amelia's plane. Another theory is that she just changed her identity, which this one's I might be crazier than the Japanese capture theory. But in November 2006, the National Geographic channel aired episode two of the Undiscovered History series. 
about a claim that Amelia survived the world flight, moved to New Jersey, changed her name, remarried, and became Irene Craigmile Bolin. Irene Bolin, who had been a banker in New York during the 1940s, denied being Amelia. And she rebutted all the claims. Kevin Richland, a professional criminal forensic expert hired by National Geographic, studied photographs of both women and cited many measurable facial differences between Amelia and Irene. Overall, like I said, this theory makes the least sense to me because Amelia was so vocal and wanted to prove women could do anything. So if she completed her world flight, she definitely would have been like, yo, I did it. You know what I mean? And she was also a very active activist. (laughs) I don't know how else to say it. Uh, She wouldn't just disappear. She was very passionate about the things that she loved to do. And she loved to tell people about it. So it makes zero sense to me. Though the whereabouts of Amelia remain a mystery, the legacy of her life and death still lives on. Amelia was a widely known international celebrity during her lifetime. And as a passionate feminist and activist, Amelia used her fame to advocate for causes that were important to her. Emboldened by her success, more and more women began applying to fly planes. Female astronauts often point to Amelia as their inspiration for daring to attempt such a challenging and dangerous career. Amelia Earhart broke all the rules and succeeded on her own terms. With that model in mind, she inspired many women to step into careers in fields like science, engineering, and computer programming, just to name a few. We might not ever know what happened to Amelia, but we do know that Amelia Earhart lived her life on her own terms. She fought against convention and pursued her dreams, regardless of what the world around her thought. Just an all-around amazing person. An amazing inspiration. So, what do you guys think happened to Amelia? I, I'm going to be boring. And I think they just, they couldn't find this tiny island. Neither of them were, pro- like, proficient enough for the radio operations. And I think they just ran out of fuel and crashed. And hopefully one day we'll be able to find their crashed plane. but. The ocean's a big place. Yeah, so I'm going to be boring. I agree with the crash and sink theory. Although the Japanese capture theory was very fun to look into. But yeah, I think they just, they ran out of luck. They ran out of fuel and they crashed and sank. But let me know what you guys think. Send us an email. Throw it in the comments. I want to know what you guys is, what you guys think. But that's it for this episode. If you enjoyed the podcast, don't forget to follow the podcast and leave a review if possible. If you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe. And you can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok with our username at TTATA Podcast. And in our bio of all of our social media is our link tree. Our link tree has pretty much everything, including our email. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, topic ideas. If you have any favorite quotes you want to send in, do it. Let us know. And with that, I'm going to leave you with an inspirational quote. The most effective way to do it is to do it. And that is by our beautiful Amelia Earhart. Thank you guys again for listening and we'll see you next episode where we'll be covering spooky things haunted things and hopefully jess will be here for that yeah so that's it okay bye